Hey there, and welcome to the Home Church YouTube channel. My name's Kenny, and I'm the lead pastor right here at Home Church based out of Denver, North Carolina. We're excited that you chose to join us for today's message, and I believe that God is going to use today's word to challenge and encourage you in your walk with Jesus. But listen, wherever you're watching from all across this world, we invite you to join us by subscribing to this channel so that you get the freshest content that we produce every single week. But also, if you'd like to partner with this ministry, we'd invite you to do that as well. Visit our website at myhomechurch.cc backslash give to partner with us. We pray that God uses this message to challenge you today and to bless you as you hear the teaching of God's word. Uh, hey, if I haven't had the chance to meet you before, uh, my name is Kenny, and I have the honor of being the lead pastor here at Home Church, and uh, we're excited that you're here today. Today is a very special day. We've been looking forward to today for a long time. Got some really fun things to share with you, um, but also before we get to that place, uh, I mean, we've been walking through a series, uh, and today is the, the culmination, the, the final piece of this series that we've been walking in called Build the Kingdom, and this entire series has been about how uh, our God is going to build his own kingdom, right? But he wants to use you and I to be a part of doing that. He, he wants to use us. And so we've been talking through this entire series about this principle that we've seen over and over and over again in Jesus' teachings and in his miracles. And, and, and the, the principle is this idea of three things. It's, it's the place, it's growth, and a result. It's the place, growth and results. So we've talked about over the last few weeks, we've talked about these things. And we said, uh, week one, we talked about the soil, the place is being the soil and, and how healthy our soil is and our soul, that's going to help things grow in a healthy way and eventually produce and yield some results. And then uh, two weeks ago, we talked about the place was our hands and how God has gifted us and given us abilities and, and opportunities. And he's put things in our hands and he's, he's asked us a stewardship question. And how are you stewarding the things that he's put in your hands, whether it be children or whether it be a job or whether it be money or whether it be a gifting? How have we stewarded those things? And eventually how we steward those things leads to a place of growth and then eventually again a result. And then last week we got a, a really cool opportunity to talk about the place of the heart. And we talked about how our heart and how it looks and, and how healthy it is and, and our willingness to give is how God wants to be able to use it. It's going to grow. And so we talked to three weeks, last week about these three places. There was a, someone who had a reluctant heart, someone who had a willing heart, and someone who had a sacrificial heart. And how God looked at all those opportunities and, and used them to grow things, and ultimately we saw a result in blessing and overflow. And so it's all been culminating to this place leading up to today where we get a chance to talk about all of these things combined together around one more place. And the place that we want to talk about today is the place of faith. The place of faith. And as scripture calls it, and Jesus talks about it in Matthew, he has this encounter with Peter when he says, Peter, who do people say that I am? And Peter says, well, people are saying that you're, you're this person, you're John the Baptist, you're Elijah, you're Jeremiah. And, and then Jesus says to Peter, he says, yeah, 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 I hear that. But, but, but Peter, who do you say that I am? And Peter responds to him and he says, well, you're the, you're the son of God. You're the Messiah. And Jesus says to Peter, blessed are you, Peter, because I haven't told you this. The world hasn't told you this. You haven't learned this by flesh and blood, but my father has given you this. And then he says on that truth, the truth that Jesus is the Messiah, he said, on that truth, on that rock, I will build my church. And so today we're going to talk about the place of faith. And how the place of faith leads us to a place of, of growth in our lives, and in our, in our personal lives, and in our family lives, and then ultimately corporately in the house of God here at this house, and then the results that we hope to see. And so I, I want to just walk you through a beautiful story, one of my favorite stories in all of Scripture. And so if you have your Bible, I'd like for you to join me in Joshua chapter 4. Uh, Joshua chapter 4, if you have your Bible, pull that out. Uh, maybe you have a version app on your phone or device, you can pull that up, and there's a live event happening right now that you can follow along with the scripture that we're going to be talking through. Uh, we're going to also throw it on the screen, and there's some Bibles in the back of the room if you'd like to follow along. And I want to walk you through this, and as you pull up Joshua 4, I want to kind of set the, set the stage here. So Moses had led the nation of Israel 
out of Egypt and through the Red Sea. He had, there was this exodus that Moses led through, and all of a sudden, then the nation of Israel was wandering throughout the wilderness. And then the servant of God, Moses, well, he died, and he passed over the mantle of leadership to a man named Joshua. And all of a sudden, Joshua is now leading this entire nation. They like to grumble a lot. They like to complain a lot. They don't like to listen a lot. Sounds familiar, right? No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. And so Joshua has this moment where they're still heading towards the promised land, but there's this impediment in the way. And it looks like a familiar impediment because 30 some odd years earlier, they had been standing in front of something that looked just like it, the Red Sea. And God performed a miracle and he parted the Red Sea. The nation of Israel walked right through on dry, dry land into freedom, away from captivity, but it eventually led them into wandering. But here they are, heading towards the promised land, and they're standing in front of this same exact looking obstacle. I don't want to read you what this says. Joshua chapter 4, verse 1. When the whole nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Choose 12 men from among the people, one from each tribe, and tell them to take up 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan, from right where the priests are standing and carry them over with you and put them down at the place where you stay tonight. And so God had told Joshua, just like I'd done before, I'm going to perform a miracle again. And so Joshua instructed the priest uh, of, of the nation who were carrying the Ark of the Covenant. These priests were holy men and they were carrying the Ark of the Covenant and inside of the Ark of the Covenant were all kinds of things. But, but most affectionately, uh, there were the tablets of Moses known as the Ten Commandments. But more than anything, you've got to understand that the Ark of the Covenant represented the presence of God to them. The presence of God. This is important. And so God told Joshua, send the priest into the water. And as soon as the priest stepped into the water, just like it had done before, the Jordan River got held up and all of a sudden, there was dry land. And the priest led the Ark of the Covenant right into the middle of the Jordan. And it says that the nation started to cross. The, the entire nation started to cross the Jordan. And when they had done that, God gave Joshua an instruction to 12, to choose one of each of the tribes of Judah, choose one person. And so there was, there was this whole nation, and all of them came from Jacob, and there were 12 tribes of Jacob. And he asked each one to have a leader, and to send them back into the, into the Jordan. Watch this, verse four. So Joshua called together the 12 men he had appointed from the Israelites, one from each tribe, and said to them, go over before the ark of the Lord, your God, into the middle of the Jordan. Each of you is to take up a stone on his shoulder according to the number of the tribes of, of the Israelites to serve as a sign among you. Watch this. In the future, in the future, get this, when your children ask you, what do these stones mean? Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. And when it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. And these stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. So I want you to, I want you to see what's happening here. So everyone had crossed the Jordan and the priest and the Ark of the Covenant was still standing in the middle of the Jordan. And all of a sudden, Joshua grabs one leader from each of the tribes, and he sends them back into the middle. Now, listen, come on, y'all. That's a little crazy, right? If, if we're being honest, you're like, okay, I got through once. I ain't sure I'm going to go run back into the middle because, right, most of us would be thinking that. At least I was. I would be. But he sends one of each of the tribe leaders back into the middle, and he says, where the priests are standing, I want you to grab a rock, put it on your shoulder, which means it's a, probably a pretty big rock, and he says, bring it back out. And so they, they, they did that. And he says, we're, we're, these were, are going to be made, this is going to build a monument so that at some point your kids, your descendants are going to see this and they're going to be reminded of God's faithfulness. It's going to be a, a, a marker of the moment. So watch what happens. So the Israelites did as Joshua commanded them and they took 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan according to the number of the tribes of the Israelites as the Lord had told Joshua, and they carried them over with them to their camp where they put them down. So they did. So they go in the middle, they pick up 12 stones, they bring them back out to their camp. Now watch, so watch what happens. This is interesting. If you just read through this, you're not really paying attention, you're going to miss this, but I'll, this is important. Watch this. Uh, verse 19, I'm sorry, verse 9. Joshua 
set up 12 stones that had been in the middle of the Jordan at the spot where the priests were carrying the Ark of the Covenant had stood. And they are there to this day. I want you to see this. This is really cool. So, so he's asked these leaders to bring out 12 stones, and they did that. They brought them out of the Jordan. But Joshua does something really here that's very interesting, and most people just skip right past this. They miss it. But Joshua himself took 12 of the stones in the middle of the Jordan while it was dry, while the priests are standing there, and he puts 12 stones together in this dry bed where the river had been at flood stage that is now dry land, and he builds this monument. See, if you just keep reading, you, you think this is all just one thing, but Joshua sets this in the middle of the Jordan. This is important. This is important for what I want to show you today. I want you to remember that. And then the story just kind of like skips on. Verse 10, now the priest who carried the ark remained standing in the middle of the Jordan until everything the Lord had commanded Joshua was done by the people, just as Moses had directed Joshua. The people hurried over, and as soon as all of them had crossed the ark of the Lord, and the, praise came, um, and the priest came to the other side while the people watched. So the priests were now leaving the Jordan. They're, they're coming out of the Jordan like everyone else had. Now skip down to verse 17. Watch this. So Joshua commanded the priest, come up out of the Jordan. Listen, come up out of the Jordan. I want you to hear this. It's going to be important. Come up out of the Jordan. And the priest came up out of the river carrying the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. And no sooner had they set foot on the dry ground that the waters of the Jordan returned to their place and ran at flood stage as before. On the 10th day of the first month, the people went up from the Jordan and camped at Gilgal on the eastern border of Jericho. And Joshua set up at Gilgal the 12 stones that had been taken out of the Jordan. And he said to the Israelites, in the future, when your descendants ask their parents, what do these stones mean? Tell them, Israel crossed the Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the ground before you until you had crossed over. it. The Lord your God did to the Jordan what he had done to the Red Sea. And when it dried up before us until we had crossed over. Watch this. He did this so that all the people of the earth might know that the hand of God is powerful, and so you might always fear the Lord your God. Now, listen, I'm a little sweaty today, and I'm sorry. I'm getting after it because, like, listen, I need to just, I want you to grab this. There's so much happening here. But I, I think if you'll just hear the word of the Lord today for you, something's going to shift in you today. I, I really believe this. I want you to, I want you to see this whole I want you to see this whole scene playing out. So the nation of Israel, for the second time in their history, got dried up a river and they walked right through it. Can anyone say miracle? Like, think about it, miracle. I mean, one time's good. A second time is like, oh my goodness, what is happening here? And all of a sudden, Joshua, everyone's out of the water and it says the water receded back to where it had been, which was at flood stage. And now he starts to gather these stones. And I can just... I can just see this moment. Joshua comes off of the riverbanks, and the entire nation is just standing here surrounding him. And I can almost just see them uh, just tribe by tribe standing here with their leader out front and their rock just kind of sitting right there in front of them. And I can almost just see Joshua going up and grabbing each rock and standing in front of that tribe and recounting some of God's faithfulness that he had seen happen in that, in that tribe over the tribe of Gad and standing there and talking to them about faithfulness and how God had brought them through things and standing in front of the tribe of Benjamin and recounting God's faithfulness and what he had brought them through and standing in front of uh, the tribe of Benjamin and just tribe after tribe, I could see him doing it. And he starts to build this altar, this, this monument, this marker of the moment where God had a, once again dried up the water so the nation could walk to freedom. And it's meant to be a marker of the moment so that sometime down the road, the descendants would ask, what do these stones mean? And we would be able to point to them and say, this is a marker of the moment of God's faithfulness yet again. Yet again. Yet again, God has been faithful to us. And listen, and I just think about this, and here's what I want you to hear today. I want you to get this for you, because this matters to you. 
And I just think about a day like today, man, and I just feel like we're just standing here and the tribes are standing in front of me. And I just look over and I just pick up the rock of the Giglio family. And I see the faithfulness of God in Darren and Kendall's life. And this new baby that's coming, and look at how faithful he's been over and over and over again in your lives. And I, and I pick up the rock of the Benfield family, and I look at how God's continued to draw you through things and health issues, even with your parents and, and Greg and traveling and all these things. And now, you know, look, look at what God's doing in your kids' lives and Jenna and Shane. Like, look at God's faithfulness in your life. And I just keep moving over and over and over again. And I, I look at the O'Leary family and Mark and Tara and God's faithfulness and what he drew you from. And he brought you out of this Catholic church into this evangelical church in, in New Jersey. And all of a sudden you have this encounter with Jesus and then you decided to move to South Carolina and through a friend invited you here. And now your neighbor sitting right beside you, your other neighbor sitting right over there. Look at God's faithfulness in your life. Look at this stone. And over here, over here, I look at Dylan Broadwater, working with Shane, invited you to come to home church on our opening Sunday, and son, I hold up the stone of faithfulness in your life that God has brought you through, and he's brought you to, and I'll never forget, almost sitting in that exact same seat on November 15th of 2020, you raised your hand and gave your life to Jesus. Look at the faithfulness of God in your life, and I can just see stone after stone in this tribe. And we just build it up, and it is a monument. It's a monument to tell our kids, to tell Jackson and, and Jesse and Josiah one day, when they're old enough to think about it and to understand and to ask the questions, why'd you do all this? It's because God's been faithful over and over and over again. And it, maybe it will draw them to a place of seeing him the way that we've seen him play out in our life. Faithful. He's been faithful. And today, I pray that God will build your faith personally, that you would take a few moments and look back over the faithfulness in your family, in your life, and the things that God has done in your life personally, the things that God has done in your family's life, and the things that God has done in this house in six months. faithfulness. Are there difficult days? Yeah, of course. Yeah, there's hard days. Days that we question. Losing our parents, miscarriages, divorce, losing our job. There's the hard days for sure. But it doesn't take away from God's faithfulness over and over and over again in our lives. And may today be a faith-building day for you. May it be a day that you look at the place of your faith. What's your faith built on? Is it built on the rock? Jesus said that he will build his church on the rock. He will build his kingdom on the rock, which is the truth of Jesus Christ. He's the son of God, the Messiah. And so I, I want to show you this. And I think that this will just encourage you and build your faith as I was Reading through and preparing for today, I want you to see this. If you have your Bible, slide over to Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3. I want to show you this. As I was preparing for today, I saw this and it just wrecked me. And this is why I'm a mess today. I'm sorry, y'all. Like, I don't think y'all have ever seen me cry from stage. I'm sorry. I don't, I'm a mess today. But I want you to see this. Watch this. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. I'm going to pause right here. By the way, Jesus' Hebrew name is Yeshua, which, oh, by the way, is actually Joshua. I want you to see this. I want you to. This blew me away when I saw it. Watch all this. Then Jesus came from the Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and yet you come to me? Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. And then John consented. Watch this. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he came up out of the water. 
And at that moment, heaven opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending on him like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love, and with him I am well pleased. And here's what I, I just, I had this revelation from the Lord that I just wanted to share with you today and encourage your faith with. I just can't help but go back and recognize that all those years ago, Joshua, before he set up this monument for the people, he went back into the middle of the Jordan where the presence of God was sitting in the Ark of the Covenant, and he put some stones down as a marker of the moment. And then, oh, check this out. Jesus, the next time we see the Spirit of God show up on the Jordan, it was in the form of Jesus, the Son of God, the Messiah, the Promised One. And all of a sudden, this presence of God is in the Jordan. And then it says this, watch this. It says he came up out of it. I just can't help but believe that as he says, we're here to fulfill all righteousness. There's a part of me that just looks at it and says, Jesus knew what Joshua had done in that moment. And here he comes. It's good to fulfill this because watch this. Now the living stones coming up out of the water. Now the promise that had been made many, many years ago is coming up out of the water. This rock, this truth is coming up out of the water. The chief cornerstone is coming up out of the water right the the builder the builders rejected this stone he's coming up out of the water he is the lord of lord and the king of kings he is the messiah he is the way the truth and the life listen this is the stone that was coming right back up out of that jordan and i just can't help but be encouraged that god had seen all of this play out and he saw this moment of faithfulness in jesus's life and watch this he starts his public ministry in this moment. I can't help but, but just believe that this stone was marking another moment of faithfulness in God's life. That all of a sudden there was a new moment of exodus coming, right? A new way to freedom in Jesus. A new way to see new life coming. A new way out of the wilderness in the form of Jesus. Do you see this? It's beautiful. And, and then all of a sudden, watch this. <laughs> Jesus comes out of the water, and he starts his three-year march to Calvary, where ultimately he was going to be hung on a cross, and the gospel would come to real life because he would pay for your sin, and he would pay for my sin. And watch this. They put him in a tomb, and oh, by the way, they had to roll a stone out of the way to look inside and see that Jesus was no longer in there and alive. And because he lives, you can live. And because he lives, I can live. And because he lives, he said the gospel is truth, and he will build his church on it. That's the rock that this house is going to be built on. This church, listen, you might have come today to hear about a building, but I came to tell you about the real thing that's getting built, and it is the church. It ain't got nothing to do with brick and mortar, and it's got nothing to do with sticks and nails. It's got everything to do with the church, the people of God, his, his role in our life, his faithfulness in our life, the way that he's continued to show up over and over and over again. He said he will build his church. That's the thing we're interested in building. I'm not interested in building a kingdom of buildings that people can come and sit in and clap their hands and do all that stuff. I'm interested in building a kingdom of God that people see life change, that stones are made living again, that lives go from death to life again. That's the kingdom that we're interested in building. So if you came today all excited about a building, you're missing out on the kingdom that we're excited about. That's what I came to proclaim today. The gospel of Jesus Christ is good for watering. And this town, which used to be called Dry Pond, will turn to green grass through the watering of that gospel. That's what we're after. This is the legacy that we're chasing after. This is the faithfulness of God in our life. Not that we would get all excited about a building. And listen, I'm excited about a building, right? I mean, most of us are. But don't let today be about that. Let today be about your faith and the stone and the rock that your faith is built on. And so my question for you is going back to that principle. What is your faith built on? Is it built on the rock, the stone, the chief cornerstone, the living stone, Jesus Christ? And if it is, Scripture tells us that it is a firm foundation, that you're going to be fine, that as long as you continue to walk in faith on Jesus that you stand on that salvation, you're going to be fine. That's where you will see growth. That's where you'll see fruit. That's where you will see results. This principle has played out over and over and over again. And I pray that you see how it can play out in your life. I pray that today 
you're challenged by the faithfulness of God and that he shows you this highlight reel of miracles over and over and over again that he's performed in your life. I have. I have. Like standing here, that's, that's part of why I'm weeping. I've been a mess all day. Before I came this morning, I gathered my three boys and I just wept over them knowing what today was going to be. And here's the reality. Today, today's another marker of a moment. Today is a day where I get a chance as, as the leader of this house to stand in front of you and to lift up the stones of the tribes in this house and to hold them up and recount God's faithfulness. And we're going to build a monument that our kids are going to be able to come back to. And they're going to ask, what does this mean? And we're going to get to say, in 2020, when we planted home church in the middle of a pandemic in somebody else's building on Sunday afternoons when Jesus might not even want to show up, right? Like, listen, look at what God's done. Look at his faithfulness. That's what we're going to build. But the reality is, is that we're growing. I don't know. Take, take a quick look around. I don't know if you can see this, but the room is full. Room is full. And for us to be able to continue to do the work that God's called us to, we have a next step to take. Because Sunday afternoons, listen, let's just be real. It's hard. It's hard. Meeting in somebody else's building, It's difficult. We have a calling on our life to continue to reach this city and beyond. And to do that, we have a next step to take. But before we take that next step, and as we take that next step, I want you to hear a little bit of God's faithfulness in just the short six months in this house. Put your eyes on the screen and watch this. This is the story of how Home Church came into existence. And so one of the things that I love most about our story is how it began. And so I'll never forget the day, the moment that God placed the calling to pastor and to lead home church over my life. Katie was shopping and uh, she was at a store that was soon to close and I was sitting in our van with our three kids in, in the back and I'll never forget this moment. I'm just staring, looking out at a parking lot at an old Kmart and I heard the voice of the Lord speak over me, home church. And in that moment, I, I didn't really know what that meant. In fact, I, I spent some time wrestling with the Lord, asking him, like, Lord, what are you saying? What do you mean? And I left that conversation with the Lord knowing that he was calling us to plant and to lead a church. And so he also gave us the name of it, the name Home Church. The idea that anyone could call this house a home. And so from there, we took this idea and we started to prepare. We started to do all the things that it took to get ourselves ready to launch and to plant. Home church. So we started into a season of preparation. We began to prepare our hearts first and foremost, making sure that we were truly following after what the Lord was calling us to do. And then we began to prepare our family and our finances. We began to put together all the paperwork that had to be done in order to launch a new church. And we began to look for a place where we were supposed to be. So as we begin to do that preparation, one of the questions that continued to be asked of us is, it's a legitimate question, which was, does Denver actually need another church? And the reality is there are a lot of churches here in Denver, but the answer to that question is a resounding yes. In fact, I, I believe it's a resounding yes. We believe it's a resounding yes. And we believe God has shown us a clear vision that there is a home for another church here in Denver. In fact, the, the clear vision God gave us is around the, t the name of this town. And so Denver, back before, you know, we live here now, actually used to have a different name. It used to be called Dry Pond. Many people don't know that. But Dry Pond was named that because there would be a pond in the town that every year it would dry up because of the heat. I mean, this, y'all know it's, it's hot here, right? And so every year this, this pond would dry up and so they named the town Dry Pond. And eventually over the years, the town got renamed to Denver, which means green grass. And as we were preparing and as God spoke the vision of home church over us, he gave me this specific word for this town. He told me that we were called to see dry ponds, spiritual and physical dry ponds in this town be turned to Denver, which is green grass through the watering of the gospel. And so for us, it was clear that God had given us a unique vision for this town, for this area, and that there was room for one more church here in Denver. So we had our first official gathering at the Sally's YMCA on September 11th, 2020, and we had about 80 people show up to come and learn about home church, 
They came to hear the visions and the values, what we believe, and really what the mission that was being set forth in front of us. And so we started to take the steps towards launching. In fact, we had a launch date of Sunday, October the 15th. And a week before we were about to launch, we found out that we had lost our location. We lost our location and this was devastating. And so we went back to the drawing board and started to look and to figure out what we could do to find a way to meet. And our friends at Pursuit Church and my friend, Pastor Jordan Green, uh, spent a whole day with me and was looking, we were driving around, we were looking all over. And finally we came to the place where he just said, hey, listen, why don't you guys use our space? And so on Sunday, November the 15th, Home Church launched. We got a chance to meet in the Pursuit Building on Sunday afternoons. And so that first Sunday, we saw 187 people come to experience Home Church for the very first time. And better than all that, on our very first Sunday, we saw one salvation. Since launch Sunday, we have seen so many amazing things happen in the life of our church. God is really working and moving. We're seeing new families come each and every Sunday. We've seen baptisms. We've seen people meet Jesus for the very first time. We got to experience our first Christmas together as a home church family. And it's just been really incredible to see all the work that God is already doing. And because of all that life change, one of the things that we keep asking ourselves the question is, well, what's next? Because we've seen growth. We've seen new families coming. We're seeing really our Sunday services begin to get full. And it's leading us to a place of asking the question, well, where do we go from here? The reality is, is that continuing to meet on Sunday afternoons in somebody else's building is just not a long-term solution. And so you couple that understanding with the growth that we've seen and the life change that we've seen and the momentum that God has been stirring up in us and allowing us to be a part of, what we've come to an understanding of is that Home Church has a next step to take. And it's a really big next step. Because listen, we're a six month old church, but we believe that God is calling us to a bold next step and to find a location, a new place to call home for Home Church. And I'm excited to share with you that we have found a home for Home Church. So you might be asking, well, is there really a need for a new location? And, and we believe, and the leadership of Home Church believes that the answer is yes. And so today, I wanted to come to you and to share with you that God has given us a vision. He has given us a plan. He has made straight the path for us to find a place to call home, a place that we can continue to reach people, a place that we can serve people, a place that we can anchor out of and operate out of to continue to take this gospel, to see dry ponds turn to green grass through the watering of the gospel, to add more seats, to serve more kids, to serve more students. And listen, home church, listen, this is just the beginning but I've got great news for you. We're so excited to show you and introduce to you the place that we're gonna call home. Home Church, take a look at this. Welcome home. I'm just gonna be super honest with you. Like leading up to like this week, we had multiple options in front of us and we're trusting that God's made a way for us to take this next step. And so we're, we're believing that this is the right next step for us. So I wanna say a couple of things very clearly. Uh, so we are working currently with the YMCA of Charlotte and the Sally's YMCA here in Denver to create a long-term partnership plan between Home Church and the YMCA. Uh, we have some agreements in principle that we're working through and we're looking to have a continued conversation about a long-term plan and agreement with some signed documents and all that fun stuff, right? So if y'all know a lawyer, send them my way. Um, so we're working through all those things, but we have some very solid plans in place. And so uh, really quickly, I wanna talk you through some of it. So the idea here, we're gonna throw some renderings up here, is for the current gym that they have, there's a wall there, we wanna rip out that wall. It's gonna create 4,000 square feet of auditorium space. The idea would be that we would be able to leave our sound, our stage, our lights, all that kind of stuff set, 
all of our production things, because listen, loading all that in, loading all that out, like anybody signing up to help? Okay, didn't, didn't think so, right? So, so we wanna set all that in place and then we'll work with the YMCA to create some barriers where they'll still be able to utilize the space during the week. Uh, and so then, uh, so that's exciting, right? We think we can fit 350 seats in that auditorium. 350 seats, okay? So you, you do that and you multiply that by like 40 kids. I mean, that's 300 and, I, I mean, what? 390, 400 people in a service times two in a morning. Listen, 800 people? No offense. I mean, it'd be the second largest church in Denver. And then we'll see what else. Well, I have an idea of what else it'll be. But let me show you this real quick. So we have uh, the atrium, right? So that will be portable, kind of like we have right here. We'll move the YMCA stuff out of the way. We'll make it still feel like home, which will be great. Uh, and then we have kid space that we're going to invest some, some money in their kid spaces to make them fit what we're looking for a little better. They're trying to step into a, a, a licensed pr a preschool program. So we want to help invest back in the YMCA with that to upgrade the kid space, and which is going to be great. Listen, my kids go there. I want it to be nice right? So, but here's the idea. We have a long-term vision and an idea of a long-term partnership with the YMCA. We want to invest in them financially. We want to invest in them with people. We want to help with programming. We want to really cohabitate their space and collaborate consistently over time. Like this isn't just a lease. Like this isn't just a, a tenant situation. Like we really want to partner with them to continue to serve our community. And along the way, as we continue to do that and make that investment, one of the things that we are working through the negotiations of is that they would gift us land that they have right there, which would be incredible because there's already a parking lot and all this stuff. And that along the way, as home church were to grow, we would be able to expand into a phase two building that would be about uh, 6,000 square feet of space that we would be able to fit 500 seats in there, some fresh kid space. And it then expands down further into their field. And so all of a sudden, this church that we've been meeting in somebody else's building on Sunday afternoons, well, now we have a place to call home. And it could very well be home forever. There's plans to grow, plans to continue to expand. And it's gonna be an unbelievable thing. Listen, most of you may not know this. It's unbelievable how God knit this together. Uh, I spent 17 years of my career working at the YMCA. Katie and I met while we were both working at the YMCA. Uh, Home Church had its very first official gathering at the Sally's YMCA on September 11th of 2020. Like, come on, somebody. Like, look at how the Lord has been faithful all over our lives. God's been planning this and preparing this. And, and listen, this is where it just like struck me that Joshua laid, listen, nobody else was around except the priest when Joshua laid those rocks in the middle of that Jordan. And then all those years later, the rock comes up out of that Jordan. I just can't help but connect these things in my life. And I'm excited about this because let me just give you a few more details. Listen, uh, this can go fairly quickly. There's a church that currently meets in there. And so they will be vacating that space in the middle of August. And so we have a target date of Sunday, September the 5th. Anybody excited about that? Yeah. Just a couple of months right? Just a couple of months. It's going to be awesome. Uh, and so there's some things that you need to know. And, and then listen, we've, we're going we're gonna to take some time over the next month to like really talk through this more. But here's what you need to know for today. Uh, there are a couple of things that you have to know for today. The reality is, is that to see a move like this, to see a, an opportunity like this, there's going to have to be an investment from our church. There just is. Sorry. Sorry. Like, people don't just give you stuff for free these days. Well, I take that back. They're giving us the use of the building, right? We're just going to have to spend some money to make it work for us. And so today, I want to let you know that as a church, we're going to put a goal in front of us of $200,000 to raise by September. By September. Now, some of you are freaking out. You're like, oh, oh. listen. That ain't nothing. Like, here, here's the reality. Like, when we planted home church, we weren't even having a, we, we had nothing. And we asked for, for God to provide. And we raised $60,000 in 40 days. And we didn't even have a church yet. 
And look at what God's been doing in our midst in six months. I'm here to tell you, whenever God calls you to something, he will provide. And listen, he's going to provide. And $200,000 to some people might be a big deal. But in the grand scheme of things, I'm just going to tell you, if you operate in facilities and business and operations and things like that, you know, that, that's a drop. Like that is a drop in the bucket. Because the other side of that is we would need $6 million to go build our own space. Anybody going to write that check for me today? I mean, if you want to, like, we can have that conversation. We're going to have to raise $200,000. And by the way, we're, we're going to have to do it fairly quickly. Okay? It's just being honest with you. Now, listen, as a church, I didn't come to you and say, hey, we want to partner with the YMCA. Throw in your vote, yay or nay. The reality is, is that you get a chance to vote with your dollars. If you believe in the vision God's given us and the direction we're walking in and you want to see this continue to move and to come to life, then you will find a way to give and be a part of this. And if not, you won't. That's okay. But there's exciting days ahead. So there's a couple of things I want to challenge you with. Everyone, when you came in today, got this. A pray and a plan card. Everyone got a pray and a plan card. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to commit to over the next month, I want you to commit to praying. I want you to commit to praying. And this walks down some of the things that we're asking you to pray about. I'm not going to read it to you, okay? But really, all it, it points all the way to Sunday, June the 13th, which is going to be our giving Sunday, okay? I'm not asking you to give anything today. I'm asking you to simply pray. Would you pray about what God would have you do to be a part of this? And then the second half of this is the plan. It's the plan. Listen, I, I, I've been preparing you since the first Sunday we met in January that this was coming. If you were with us, you know. Like, I've been kind of giving you the hints. Like, hey, oh, by the way, get ready. Like, and here we are. And we still have a month to plan. And here's what I, I, I am going to read through this. This is important. Because I want you to consider these things. First and foremost, are you already tithing to home church? A 10% of what God gives you, are you already giving that back? Because like I said last week, it does us no good to go and try to get in a brand new building if we can't afford to be in it, right? Like we'd be house broke. We don't want to be house broke. And so the first thing for you is, are you tithing? And then the second thing is to understand what an offering is. An offering is a gift above and beyond your tithe. And by the way, I want you to be, I'm going to be very clear on this. Anything you give to the Build the Kingdom campaign and towards this it is considered an offering, which means you can't give an offering if you're not tithing, okay? It's an offering above and beyond. So here's some questions for you. What expenses might I give up so that I might give generously? And some of you guys are thinking, yeah, yeah, I could give up like Dunkin' Donuts or Krispy Kreme for a year, awesome. Others are, of you are thinking about maybe something bigger. Maybe, maybe I need to sell that, that, uh, that car that's been costing me 800 bucks a month. How about that boat that you got that's 50 grand? I'm just saying, just being real. What events might you be willing to postpone? Like, here's the reality. You know that Disney trip's gonna cost you 10 grand, <laughs> right? Maybe, maybe, maybe you're not supposed to go to Disney this year. Here's a big one, because most people only think about what's in your pocket, but here's the reality. I want you to see this. What land, stocks, bonds, or other resources do you have that you could potentially gift to home church? In fact, I'll just be very honest with you. This is the way Katie and I have chosen to give to this campaign. I told you I worked 17 years at the YMCA. I'm not going to retire at the YMCA. And I have a retirement account there that's over $30,000. And we've agreed that we're going to gift that account to, the, to, the, to home church as our gift towards this campaign. That's, our, that's the way we're doing it, right? And oh, by the way, I, I'm not telling you that to brag. I'm just simply telling you this. There ain't no way in the world I would stand up here and ask you to give to that if I'm not going to go first. And I'll tell you this, and I say this with confidence, and I say this with clarity and with humility. Katie and I have gone first every step of the way in this house. Every step of the way, we've tried to lead the way first. And we're going to do that again. Here's the last thing. Listen. We got a fairly small church, right? We're, we've seen 200, 250 people on a real big Sunday. We'll probably see that today. I don't necessarily expect $200,000 to come from this church. Here's what, I, here's what I believe God told me. 
Somebody in this room knows somebody that could literally strike the $200,000 check themselves. Who do you know that has a heart to see the kingdom be built? Who would see what God's doing in this house and say, that's an unbelievable move of God. I want to invest in that. I want to give to that. I believe that some of us know someone and it might not be you and it might not be your mama, but it might be your boss. It might be your boss's boss, right? It might be uh, somebody that you know that wants to see the kingdom be built, that you can help create a conversation for us that could lead to someone giving at an unbelievable level. And so these are the things that I want to ask you to pray over and plan over until Sunday, June the 13th. Also, I want to tell you about this. Any questions that you might have, you want to look at the renderings, you want to, oh, well, Kenny, how y'all going to spend that money? Great, great questions. All available to you right now on this website that we created just for this, buildthekingdom.cc. If you go to buildthekingdom.cc, that video that you watched, the proposed budget, the goal, a whole list of question and answers is all right there available for you to look. And oh, by the way, if you got more questions, I'm here, I'm available. Whatever you got, I'll be glad to answer. This has been a process that we've been walking through for over six months. And I can just tell you this, part of the reason that I've been so weepy today is because of what God's been doing in me through this process. We have five elders who are within inside of our church and you can ask any one of them. This has been an absolute like grind of a labor to decide what's right for us. And I committed to come to you today with one vision for the direction of our church. And this is it. This is it. We're going to run after it with everything that we have. We're going to give to it with everything that we have. We're going to just, with everything that we have, we're going to follow the vision that God's given us. And listen, we'll see. We'll see what happens. I, what, what happens if we don't raise 200 grand? I, I don't know. We'll, we'll see when we get there. What happens if the YMCA decides they don't want to do these things? Listen, it's okay. Either way, there's still space at the Y starting in August. No matter what, we're going to move in there. It might be way scaled down. We'll figure that out. But no matter what, when the time is available, we will move to the YMCA, which means we will be moving to the morning. Can I get an amen from anybody in the room? I'm about to rush some laps. <laughs> Today is a marker of the moment. Today, I want you to almost, I want you to do this. I don't, I don't I don't even care if it makes you uncomfortable. I want everyone to put your hands out and I want you to imagine you holding a stone. And here's the stone. The stone represents your life and the things God has done in your life. The stone represents your family, your tribe, the things God has done in your family and in your tribe's life. And I'm holding the stone that represents this house. Six months. Six months we've been doing this. And we've seen salvation, baptisms, life change, families after families coming to be a part of this. I can't tell you the messages and the encouragement I get for the, the, the way that God is working in your lives. Like, listen, today is a marker of the moment that God is ready for us to take a next step. And here's what I want you to do today. Today, you're gonna place the marker of your life down. You're gonna place down the, the stone of your family. And I'm gonna place down the stone of this house as a marker of the moment that today, and at some point down the road, your kids and my kids and your grandkids and their great grandkids, and all the way down the annals of however long until Jesus comes back, will come and look at this house and these stones. And they're gonna say, what does that mean? And down the generations, here's what we're gonna say. The Lord has been faithful over and and over and over and over and over and over again in my life and in our family and in this house. And it is meant to tell the world of how good our God is. That's the kingdom that we're trying to build. Thank you for taking the time to enjoy this message from Home Church. We hope that God used today's message to encourage you and to challenge you as you heard the teaching of his word. Listen, if there's anything in today's message that spoke to you, or if you asked Jesus into your life today, let us know. We would love to celebrate with you. Simply send us an email at hello at myhomechurch.cc and let us know that you made that decision today. 
Also, if today's message uh, impacted your life, uh, you can take a step forward and a step into supporting the ministry of Home Church by giving online right now at myhomechurch.cc. Again, thank you for watching today's message. Make sure you like and subscribe so that you get all of the fresh content from Home Church.